All right. Uh, for the final exam, you need to go over some of these points that I'm going to cover up in this uh, video. And uh, you need to take a nice uh, study guide, make a study guide, and prepare for the exam. Starting with chapter 8, which is basically uh, about fluids, you should know the basic idea of density. You'll find this on page 271. Um, density of different objects and then the other concept that you need to know is about buoyancy. Uh, before you learn about buoyancy, the connected topics is pressure. So how is pressure created? What is pressure? Pressure is force over area. So you should be able to understand the definition of pressure, what is pressure measured in, what is um, what's the unit of pressure, and all those things. Uh, how is pressure exerted in a gas? How is pressure exerted in a fluid? So pressure in a gas is because of collisions of atoms and molecules against each other and uh, pressure in a created by a solid like something sitting like that is because of the force exerted over the area force over area uh, the pressure created by a fluid is also going to be the force over area the pressure by the fluid pressure by fluids is H dg you know that equation height or depth times density times gravity this is a pressure by fluids alone but the absolute pressure is going to be the atmospheric pressure plus the pressure in fluids so you should have a clear concept of pressure itself so the absolute pressure is going to be the pressure atmosphere plus the pressure of the fluid okay so this is some very basic requirement, the knowledge requirement for pressure. Uh, what is atmospheric pressure measured? Uh, with what instrument will you measure atmospheric pressure? It's called a barometer. So a barometer is used to measure atmospheric pressure. Now coming back to the buoyant force. What is buoyant force? It's a force created is a force exerted by the fluid on an object and it's upward force. So the upward force is called buoyant force and what explains buoyancy is Archimedes principle. So understand the, the Archimedes principle. What is Archimedes principle? You should be able to read Archimedes principle from uh, You should be able to read Archimedes principle from page 272. Okay, so Archimedes principle is the buoyant force exerted by a fluid is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. That is called Archimedes principle. All right, and then a special case of Archimedes principle is flotation. Now, flotation is a situation where the buoyant force um, equals the weight of the object, like when a ship is floating. All right, when the ship is floating, that is Archimedes principle in action again. Flotation. Um, the next concept is Pascal's principle. Now, what is Pascal's principle? It says in a fluid, Pressure is transmitted, whereas in a solid, only force is transmitted. So in a fluid, pressure is transmitted, and in a solid, force is transmitted. And where is this Pascal's principle used? Pascal's principle is used in your car brake, hydraulic lift, and all the hydraulic 
concepts or Pascal's principle. And these are explained on page 276, 277. You should be able to see uh, Pascal's principle on those pages. Uh, the next concept is about fluid flow. And fluid flow is explained on page 280, 281. Fluid flow, uh, fluid flow the equation of continuity is A1, B1 is equal to A2, B2. That means wherever the area is small, the velocity has to be bigger. Speed of, speed of the fluid should be higher. So that is a concept that is discussed on page 280, 281. You should have an idea of that. And connected to that is Bernoulli's principle. Bernoulli's principle, what does it say? It says that wherever the fluid goes fast, the pressure is low. And wherever the fluid is slow, the pressure should be high. And some of the applications of Bernoulli's principle, you uh, saw the, you know, the airplane wings, how the lift comes through is because of Bernoulli's principle. Um, um, the spray bottles, all those atomizers, they kind of work on Bernoulli's principle. The curveball and all those things work on Bernoulli's principle. And you can see those things written down. On page 282, you can see some information about Bernoulli's principle and how the pressure changes with the speed. Okay, So that is about Bernoulli's principle and you should know its applications as to where it's applied. Moving on from fluids to chapter 9, which is heat, what you should know over there in chapter 9 is, first thing is about temperature conversions. You can look into your textbook or you can look into the notes. You will see those things on page uh, 300, 301, you'll see temperature conversions. You have done a bunch of them in class. And you should know how to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit to Celsius, and Celsius to Kelvin. So make sure you know the formula for those things. And then heat energy. What is heat energy? Heat energy is mainly the sum of kinetic and potential energies on a system. Now, how does heat flow? Heat flowing from one place to another place, there are three ways of heat flowing. One is conduction, so heat transfer. These things are mentioned on page 308 onwards. Uh, you have the three methods of heat transfer, which is conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction basically is when atoms bump into each other and pass the energy from neighbor to neighbor. That is thermal conduction. Convection is when you have a bulk movement of fluid because of the changes of temperatures and therefore uh, it changes the density and it starts, uh, the, the fluid itself starts moving from one place to another place because the fluid gets displaced as it becomes lighter it starts rising and so there will be a circulation and that's called convection. Um, you should know how where convection is applied and the other form of heat transfer is radiation. Radiation is a heat transfer that doesn't require any medium. It can actually travel in vacuum and it is an electromagnetic sort of um, wave so heat radiations are electromagnetic in nature. Um, they can travel best in vacuum. They don't require a medium. So that concept should be known. And, and then you should know specific heat capacity definition. What is specific heat capacity? It's amount of energy. So specific, specific heat capacity. 
is how much heat energy is needed to increase the temperature of one kilogram of a substance by one degree Celsius or one Kelvin. You can look into your notes and see the definitions or you can see the definitions in the textbook. Now different materials have different specific capacities. Okay, so I mentioned those things in class and those things are also mentioned in your textbook on page on page 314 you can see a list of specific capacities and you know among all substances water has got the highest specific capacity that's why it's used in coolants as a coolant in your radiators and so on so that is the information that you need to know about thermal physics uh, mainly these are the main things <clears throat> and moving on from there to chapter 10 oh no, chapter 10 is not there you don't require chapter 10 forget about chapter 10 moving on to chapter 11 which is vibrations and waves in vibrations and waves you need to know what is simple harmonic motion? Simple harmonic motion. Um, the first things we learned in simple harmonic motion is some of the definitions of simple harmonic motion, like definitions of frequency. What is the frequency meaning? What is the meaning of time period? And what is the meaning of amplitude? So those are things that we kind of touched upon in simple harmonic motion. So when something is vibrating, uh, it has a certain frequency of vibration, it has a certain time period of vibration, so you should know each and every term. The connection between frequency and time period is frequency is 1 over time period or time period is 1 over frequency. Frequency is measured in hertz and time is measured in seconds. Now we also went through um, Hooke's law and that is F is equal to kx k is called the spring constant or force constant F is measured in newtons x is the extension which is measured in meters so you have to make sure that force is in newtons and x is in uh, meters and then you should be able to find k using this equation F over x is k so that is how we apply Hooke's law and we also talked about simple pendulum and spring pendulum Sp simple pendulum and spring pendulum they are on pages 367 is on spring pendulum and 3 74 and 75 that will be on simple pendulum so you should know how to use those equations for simple pendulum time period is 2 pi radical L over G for a spring pendulum time period is 2 pi radical M over K K is called the spring constant uh, what you should know is as the length of the pendulum increases the timing will increase and when the timing increases, the frequency will actually come down. So it will be low frequency. And if the length is shorter, then the time period will be shorter. And when the time period is shorter, the frequency will be higher. Frequency stands for like how many times it moves back, back and forth. That's what it is. Now, on this one, if the mass of the object that is vibrating is bigger, the time period is going to be bigger, which means the frequency is going to be shorter. So understand how each of these terms affects the other terms. Okay, that is about simple harmonic motion, simple pendulum and spring pendulum. Then moving on from there to waves. Moving from there to waves. In waves, you have a bunch of things to learn. Okay, again, 
when you look at a wave you have what is known as amplitude so you should know the definition of amplitude you should know the definition of wavelength which is how far the wave can travel in one time period so you should know the definitions of what is wavelength what is amplitude what is uh, frequency and what is the wave velocity and what is the equation for the whole thing v is equal to f lambda you should know how to apply this equation v is in meters per second f is in hertz and lambda should be in meters and then remember waves can be two types transverse which is what you see in here and longitudinal in transverse the particles move up and down whereas the energy goes forward you can see all those things written down on page 380 and longitudinal waves are when particles oscillate left and right when the energy goes forward that means parallel so the particles are moving parallel to the direction of energy here the particles are moving perpendicular to the energy travel and you will see it on page 381 and then what happens when waves meet so when two waves meet in the same place like that when two waves meet together it's called interference and this will be a constructive interference but when two waves meet in in an opposite manner like that then that is destructive interference you can see those things written down on page 386-387 and then reflection reflection of waves suppose you send a pulse like that to a fixed boundary what happens to this pulse you can read that on page 388 on page 388 it will tell you what happens to this pulse when it hits a fixed boundary it will actually go and get reflected and also get inverted whereas when this pulse moves on to a free boundary like that when it goes into a free boundary this will get reflected but it won't be inverted and you can read those things again the next thing is about when two waves identical waves go in opposite directions it can set up a standing wave so what is a standing wave a standing wave is a standing wave is a wave that appears not to be moving at all and there are points called nodes which are not moving and there are points called antinodes, antinodes, antinodes and those are things that you can see written on page 389 389, 390 the distance from this place, from this node to this place here that is one wavelength so the distance from here to here is half a wavelength and the distance from a node to an antinode is only quarter wavelength understand the idea of standing waves so standing waves are formed if, if you pluck a guitar string that's the standing wave so you should have a clear idea of standing waves and then you also should know that when uh, the, the term resonance what is resonance when the natural frequency of vibration of an object is matched by a forcing forcing frequency then amplitude builds up and that is called resonance so read about it and then you have the intensity intensity calculations like intensity is power over 4 pi r square where r is a distance so you should know how to find the intensity if I give you both of these or if I give you intensity and distance then you should be able to find the power and vice versa if i give you power and intensity you should be able to find out the distance so that is about intensity calculations and in sound you should know what causes sound vibrations cause sound and sound is longitudinal so sound is this way sound is longitudinal and sound is a mechanical wave so it needs a medium it cannot pass through vacuum sound travels pretty slowly in air but fastest in you know steel and substances like that and um, also you should be aware of 
Doppler effect. You should know clearly what happens when a sound is when a sound is when a source of sound is moving in a certain direction, it tries to squeeze the waves on one side. So it squeezes the waves on one side. So what happens when this is actually moving this way, the waves on this side will get compressed, whereas the waves on this side will get pulled out. So when this is moving in that direction, creating the sound, the wavelength here becomes shorter and the wavelength behind it will be larger. And because the wavelength is shorter, according to the formula V is equal to F lambda, for the same speed, when the frequency, when the wavelength is shorter, the frequency will be bigger. And on this side, when the wavelength is bigger, the frequency will be smaller. So, frequency will be smaller because the wavelength is bigger. So, when a source of sound approaches an observer, the observer is going to hear a higher frequency. When the source of sound is going away from an observer, he's going to hear a lower frequency. So, towards increases, frequency increases, away frequency decreases. Towards wavelength decreases, away wavelength increases. So keep that Doppler effect concept in mind. And um, you also will need to know the harmonics concepts of harmonics that you've learned. There are three things. One is uh, closed tube, um, open tube, In a closed tube, it's like this. The simplest wave is an antinode here and a node here. So that's the simplest one. That's the simplest one, which is uh, one quarter of a wavelength. And the next one that you can set up on a, on the same tube is antinode here and node here. So it will be like this. Now since this one has got a sh Wave, its wavelength is one third shorter. The frequency of this is f. This will be three f. The next one is going to be five f, and so on. That is what happens in a close. These are called the harmonics. First harmonic, second harmonic, third harmonic. Open tube is supposed to have an antinode on both ends. So it goes like this and like that. So you'll have one node in the middle. Compared to this. The second one, the second harmonic, is going to have two nodes. So the frequency of this is f, this will be 2f, the next is 3f, and so on. Now, open tube and a stretched string are exactly alike. So, stretched string, you can have a single wave like this. You can have double. So this is frequency f, this is 2f and 3f. That is 3f. So these are called the harmonics and you should not have a clear idea of what is harmonics. The next thing is about beats. You know that when there are two frequencies that are pretty close to each other, the difference between F1 and F2 is called the beat frequency. So if one is sounding, if one frequency is 1000 hertz and the other sound is 1005 hertz, then the difference between these two is just 5 hertz. That's going to be the beat frequency. Um, and then and then you need to know the characteristics of sound such as pitch, um, uh, loudness and quality. Okay, the quality of sound is depending on the waveform. Amplitude decides the loudness and frequency decides the pitch. So you should have that concept clear. And then we did a little bit on light and that is that is the only thing that is needed. So what do you need to know about light is light is an electromagnetic wave. Um, it travels 
at 3 10 power 8 meters per second and for light you use the equation c is equal to f lambda so c is equal to f lambda is what you need for light and this is the speed of light and this is the frequency and frequency must be in hertz and lambda must be in meters and the basic uh, things that we've done about light is about reflections so you should understand about reflections what are the characteristics of the image formed you should know that also and that is pretty much what is expected of you from from optics okay all the best um, make good notes about these things and then bring it welcome for the test all right good luck